Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner. Today, I'd like to welcome James F. Jordan, Distinguished Service Professor of Healthcare and Biotechnology at Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College, and a healthcare and life science expert. Mr. Jordan is the author of Innovation, Commercialization, and Startups in Life Sciences. Today, he's going to share his thoughts on how we can improve our healthcare system. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, locumstory.com. Maybe you're curious about locums and how it might fit into your career story. But do you know all the different reasons physicians choose locums and how it works for them? At locumstory.com, you can hear firsthand stories as diverse as physicians themselves. There's not one solution for everyone. The variety of opportunities might surprise you. Locum Story is an unbiased educational resource. It has tools that let you explore trends in your specialty and compare different locums agencies. There's even a simple quiz to see if locums is right for you. Do your own research at locumstory.com. It's easy. Okay, and now to my guest, James Jordan. Welcome, Mr. Jordan. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for joining me on the program. We were talking briefly just before uh, I started recording, and uh, it sounds like you are a very busy guy. So thank you for taking the time to uh, speak with us. Uh, so you are an expert in healthcare and life sciences. To just give a, me a little bit about your background, how all that happened. Sure. And I, I think no one can be an expert in all that, really, right? So I started my career on the uh, medical device side. I worked with uh, Beck and Dickinson, C.R. Bard, Boston Scientific. And then I uh, did a couple of startups along the way. And I found myself at uh, as vice president of marketing with Johnson & Johnson in, in the cardiology space. So I had that experience. And then I switched into sort of the biggest company nobody knows about. It's called McKesson. It's like a Fortune 5 at any given moment or 10. And they distribute throughout the entire healthcare system, pharmaceutical, healthcare, information technology, medical, surgical supplies. And so there I started modeling all the business models because the fact as a marketeer, you know, you need to figure out how these products work in all these different verticals. And I ended up coming to Pittsburgh in 2005 to uh, work with this nonprofit and for-profit venture capital fund focused on commercializing companies. And along the way, I, I felt like the baby boomers and healthcare reform was going to happen. This was, But it just felt like it had to happen. And so I went down to Carnegie Mellon and I started talking about that uh, at the time I felt the uh, manufacturers were the tail that wagged the dog, which for the listeners that might not know, that means the smaller part is controlling the bigger. And I felt insurance and providers were going to be the future. And um, they offered me a job. And, and so I, we were talking earlier, I had this unbelievable faculty. So we had to get together on what the curriculum should be and the faculty had to approve it. And so I started this website called healthcaredata.center where I basically researched business models. And then I started teaching a course called health systems, which was really teaching the students when they came in all the business models of healthcare. And, and what I realized it's, uh, it's the business model of healthcare that's, that's vastly broken. And it ends up resulting in us having one of the highest cost systems in the world. And at any given year, we're ranked number 11 to 13 in our quality, which is just really uh, abysmal. Yes. Uh, you know, and how, it, well, you know, in the next 15 minutes, we're going to talk about how to fix it. Uh, one of the problems that I see and that all physicians see, you know, unless you work at a place like the Cleveland Clinic or the Mayo Clinic, where everything is sort of connected, I live in uh, Memphis and in Memphis, we have more, I don't know, must be close to a dozen separate hospitals and, and none of them communicate with the other ones. And so, but patients go to all of them, you know, patients. Oh, where'd you go? I went to St. Francis and the time before that I went to Methodist and now I'm here at my hospital, regional one. We do not have an easy way to get the medical records. Uh, you know, the patient's there, they're sick. And I'm sure there's some way of formally requesting them, but by the time they it would ever happen, 
uh, you know, it's like, well, you know, did they have a CT scan when they were at St. Francis two days ago? Well, I don't know. They don't remember. We don't have the results. So we repeat it. I mean, it's really so wasteful and it's not good for the patient because now the patient's going for a scan. Either they, they didn't need and they're paying for it or somebody's paying for it. And, and instead of doing what, what we should be doing, which is the next step, we're, we're back doing the first step. As you can see, it's so incredibly frustrating, but nobody seems to have an incentive to uh, make sure that these things communicate. What are we so doing about that? I think you nailed the that? word incentive. Incentive is is perfect description of of what's going on. So it's not a systems issue to to the extent that you think. So historically, um, when electronic health records first came out, they certainly didn't connect. You know, in two thousand and eight, as well as they they do today for certain. And so at that point in time, I I think the statement of connection and technology issue was there. But if you're the CEO of a hospital, there's something called a lifetime value of a patient, right? So if I'm insuring you and you don't have any health issues, it's great. But if if I've had my preventive maintenance visit with you annually, and then all of a sudden you need the big cancer or heart treatment, you go to another system, I just lost you. And so there's not a lot of motivation to let the the, the patient loose. And, and, and they tend to make it a little harder. And now they'll initially use the word confidentiality, and if you look at the the timing of regulation, the cybersecurity penalties and regulation part, the HIPAA part, were in the 2008 to say 2014 range. Um, those penalties were way higher than the, the the motivation for interoperability, and so with healthcare reform, the motivation for interoperability was put in there, but it was more of a carrot. And I don't know if you've noticed in the past 24 months, the government always goes carrot to stick. And so now we have a stick. So people kind of put their toes on lines to say they're in compliance, but they really um, weren't meeting the full extension of, of, of the intention because the real intention of the interoperability is if you think of a donut and the hole in the donut is the 18% of our economy, the rest of the people are trying to take their skills and bring it into the system. And, and you know, it's a good way for healthcare to keep them out. And so interoperability has two levels of concern if you're a hospital administrator or CEO. It's, it's you know, do I lose my patient in, at the beginning? And then at some point, you know, what money do I make today that maybe Amazon's going to pick up or, or someone else? So we have this governmental balance of trying to motivate interoperability and cybersecurity against the motives, or as you point, the incentives of what someone in a hospital system might have. So it's these, it's these three toggle points always being balanced to try to, you know, get some happy medium. We're so far from there. I think there should be some incentive or counter incentive that if a patient comes to, to my hospital and they're sick, that there's a law that says we, it is incumbent upon us to get their records before we treat them, that we have to know what's happened to that. It shouldn't be the patient's job. I find myself in clinic telling a patient, well, could you go to St. Francis and get a copy of your scan and bring it here? It should not be the sick. Sound like I'm on a soapbox here, but it should not be the sick patient's responsibility. To, so I would say to bring their records. Yeah. So I would say I'm going to make a guess that 90 plus percent of facilities have a process by which you release the records and they follow it. The question is the timing of it, right? The timing of you receiving that record is two weeks after you've had the appointment. I think that's where a lot of the patients go and, and try to perturb the system to get their, their records sooner. Right, which is useless. So, uh, you know, if you get a test and, uh, you know, the, you need it now, you need this information now. If you get it all later, then it's like reading a historical, you know, novel about uh, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. You know, it's very important, but it's not helping you uh, today. So uh, I think that's something, you know, the inter and HIPAA certainly is a concern, right? We don't want to, we don't want anybody to access these computers and get private information. But I think, as I think you hinted at, this has been used more as an excuse to uh, prevent interoperability between systems rather than a, a real 
concern. It's like, oh, well, we can't do that because of uh, HIPAA. We can't share this. You know, um, there's got to be a way. In fact, well, the Veterans Administration, you know, it doesn't matter what VA hospital you're in all over the country. And of course, there's limitations that the VA has. But one of them is not medical records. A patient could be in the VA in Long Beach, California, where I did my internship and show up at the Boston VA and you just type their name in and boom, there's all well, their records. Part of that is there's only one way of doing things at the VA. So it's funny when I, it, that you mentioned this because when I, I did a, a podcast myself with a gentleman who's got a lot of experience in, around the rest of the world. And he was talking about France and the UK and these other places. And, and although they have public systems, they also have private systems. However, they use the same infrastructure. And I did a podcast with a doctor in New Jersey the other day who told me he had 32 unique contracts with insurance companies that had different triggers and mechanisms for him to get reimbursed. And at the same time, he said, you know, I just treat someone. Now I'm spending double the time of treating someone, figuring out how I'm going to get paid. And, and those are the, the pieces of the system that, that need to be fixed. I, in my classroom, when I'm when I'm teaching, I hold up an American Express card and a Visa card, and I say to myself, why is it some places won't take this American Express because it's half a point higher? But yet, from a regulatory perspective, we've allowed insurance companies to keep no more than 20 cents on the dollar, albeit today they're around 15, so they, they are improving. But from a regulation, we allowed them to keep that kind of money, and why? What, what is it that they're doing when I've got hospital systems operating at a 4% profit? I've got physician offices that are going out of business because they they can't keep the infrastructure and administration up or they're, they're selling their practices to bigger organizations. Um, I think there was a New York Times article literally last night talking about venture capital. Yes, now yes, starting. I saw that. Yeah. So what's, what's happening is when the High Tech Act happened, when healthcare reform started, there was this requirement for infrastructure and reporting systems. And, and what that really meant for a lot of private practices, anywhere from two hundred dollars to $400,000 in, in infrastructure that was required. And so they were sort of forced to, to merge up. Now, because we've advanced cloud systems so much, I actually have talked to two doctors recently that have taken their practice out and gone back to private, which I can't say it's a statistical trend, but I, it really surprised me talking to them like, oh, I can get all that in the cloud now. So I think, you know, venture capitalists looking in and saying, okay, well, maybe there's a middle here. Maybe we have a lot of people that went inside thinking they were going to have a quality of life or or, or maybe get, um, uh, they were incentivized a lot of times with bonuses that they never received, right? So they said, you know, you haven't been making money over these years. Come on in, and we'll we'll keep your salary where it's at, but we'll we'll bring you back up to where you were with these bonuses. But then they start cross charging all these things, and a lot of people aren't getting them, and so they're spinning back out. So I think venture capital is starting to say, okay, well, let's meet in the middle. We can we can fund you, and we can, you know, take care of some of those issues. Do you have any fixes for us? How can we attack some of these problems and fix them? So I think the majority of the initial problems, it's going to be continuous improvement, of course, but inside the hospital, we're, we're doing quality improvement things like augmented reality on spinal surgery and precision medicine and that kind of stuff. But truth be told, if you were to step back and look at the entire system, it's errors, duplications, and the amount of, of paperwork. And so everyone wants to talk about artificial intelligence doing all these cool things actually in, in, the, in the practice. And I think the first layer of, of you know, reducing cost and your, your art of the medicine is, is appropriate because what you want a physician to do is have information and spend his day being intuitive, right? So if you think about if you think about our statistics classes we took when we were in high school, it was the tale of the variance, right? Where all the, the unique things came up. And, and so why is it that a, an older seasoned physician sort of has some judgment calls and things that maybe a younger one wouldn't? It's because they saw the tale of that variance. So what you'd like to see is let's take care of the administration stuff first. Second layer, come in and avail variants to physicians so that they can spend more time with their patients, which is really what they wanted to do. If you look at a, the uh, American Medical Association did a survey last year about the not only the pay, but the stress and, and actually the, the mental health issues that are going on with physicians, it's just staggering. 
And we also have a physician shortage coming. And so, you know, we, we need to let physicians get back to being physicians. And one of the most interesting insights someone gave me a few weeks ago was a general surgeon. He said to me, all of us physicians have to be, you know, mentally fully and, and flexible. But he goes, you know, if I have surgeries eight hours a day for, you know, five days a week, he goes, that's very physical. That's very, um, a lot of dexterity and a lot of physical. Well, if I'm doing reimbursement forms and now I'm only practicing that three days a week, not only am I not making money, but as I get older, I don't have the stamina. And so we're, we're actually, I, that was shocking to me. Like, wow, we're like, it's like taking an athlete and saying you can't work out. Yes. Or, or you know, you have this guy, he's going to be uh, running track in the Olympics, right? And he's training and he's got to get enough sleep. And then you come to him, you know, the day before the meet, he says, well, you got to fill out all these papers, you know, before you can run, it shouldn't take more than half a day. And it's like, yeah. that's not his skill, right? That's not his talent. Right. And, uh, you know, why is he doing that? Um, but well, you can't run unless you do it. And, uh, you know, there's a system out there. Well, everyone would agree that that's absurd. You know, I use the example, you know, you're checking out of the supermarket, right? There's a line and there's a scanner and you're going to pay. And uh, then uh, everybody that's going to pay has a different way they're going to pay. <laughs> right. Like, so the girl behind the counter says, oh, how are you paying today, sir? It's like, is it a credit card or there's 27 other ways. I mean, that's what the insurance companies do to the physicians. Right. A different contract, different criteria, different. I mean, how a business can't function that way. You know, you're going to pay in cash. You're going to pay in credit card. You get two choices. You don't get 35 choices and how you're going to pay. And then they don't pay. And then you got to chase it. Right. Or the claim is denied. Or I mean, everybody who has had interactions with the healthcare system, I'm talking about patients will say they got a bill. And they can't understand it. And they think they paid it. And it's wrong. Every single person I bet in the United States that has gone to a doctor who hasn't paid cash has gotten a bill that's incomprehensible or wrong. So, so I think that, you know, in defense for the craziness, I, I don't think if you, if you look at any system, you must at the beginning of trying to automate it, have the experts in there to give judgment. So I, I don't think there's any way we could have started this process without physician input, but what administration should have done during those initial years is circle these physicians and these nurses and people filling these out with great curiosity, trying to standardize it and get that burden off of these pioneers. You know, they, they, what's the old saying? You can tell the pioneer they're the ones with the arrows in the back. You had to have that technical group be the people that gave insight. It's just that administration hasn't reacted or even maybe the industry. Now, I don't know if you know this, but there's... Uh, something called ICD-11 coming to the United States. It's been approved by the World Health Organization for your audience. It's a way that we collect morbidity and mortality. And um, it wasn't designed to be a reimbursement system, but the U.S. sort of has backboned it to the reimbursement system. And what they've done is they have partnered with a group called SNOMED, which was part of the early electronic medical group nonprofit that worked with them to get the technical terminology, the, the physician terminology standardized around the world. So if you say, you know, a, you know, diabetes two or something in one language, it's, it's all the same. So they've partnered for this release. And so ICD-11 is supposed to be set for the digital world. And my, my hope is that this is finally a backbone, but it's been, you know, 20 years. It's really slow to your point. I think you, uh, we both agree that the problem is incentive. Now, the people making the EMR, so long as people are buying it, they don't have a big incentive to improve it or change it. Oh, it's good enough. Um, I, I heard the woman who owns, uh, I think it's Cerner, right? She developed it. It's not, or the other one. What's, what's the, other the big one? It was the other one. Epic. Yeah. Epic. Yeah. And someone said, oh, you know, physicians are, you know, not, not that pleased with the, the, the operability. Oh, no, that's not true. We don't hear any complaints. Just denied, you know, flat out that there was even a problem. And uh, it's like, well, that's corporate America. If you're high enough, you know, in the chain, you could just say, oh, it didn't even happen. Um, well, again, it really wasn't ever initiated um, with, it was meant to be sort of a data warehouse of patient records. No one ever really in, at the beginning of it 
thought of it as the basis of of providing you know it was one way it wasn't designed to necessarily ah. be two ways and so i think you know as we're talking about predictive analytics and artificial intelligence you know everyone's sort of saying is it the electronic health record that's going to do that or is it going to be some other software that's going to access that information to do a different thing and hmm. so i think we're in that center right now trying to decide that obviously it's going to be the motivation of the electronic health care record folks to try to specialize in those areas and i think they're sort of taking a you know if you think of your your apple phone with your app they're trying to take an app approach where you can plug things on but at the end of the day you know the people that do big data and and analytics i i think i'm i don't know when this future will be but i imagine the more data we have the better off we are and i think that data is going to actually go outside of the hospital into big databases it's some point in time and be proven. I mean, I, I always go back to the sci-fi movies where people are having conversations with the computer and they're actually, it, it's the person having the conversation that's getting the data and creating a hypothesis, right? Or creating some insight that maybe the computer may or may not have had. The assumption there is that it's a perfectly validated, unbiased database, right? <laughs> and we're just years, we're years away from that. But what you'd like to see is the vision is a physician being able to look at his or her patients and have variants come to them first and and be able instead of going through 200 records to get the vital piece of information that the vital piece is is availed to you and also you shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel in mm -hmm. other words my hospital has 300 beds and we have records and the hospital across the street has 300 beds and they have their records and they don't communicate but, you know, each one of us is probably going to have one case of uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease this year because it's like one in a million patients. My town is less than a million. So I might get a case this year and then they might get a case next year. And these cases are very difficult to recognize. Um, but if we shared our communal experience, and of course, we'd expand that to the whole country, not just these two hospitals are literally across the street from each other, uh, it's there's the potential to improve uh, patient care through physician education and recognition and systems. So I think there's this sort of tantalizing uh, promise that data and AI uh, has. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, it seems, seems out of reach. So I think we're we're sort of dog boning it. So if you were to look pre-COVID at the data on the CDC website, and then today you can see the, the public health and hospitals, I can actually take, I think it's like 12 diseases and I could tell you in each hospital what's going on. So you can see that effort being happened. And then you can see these precision medicine models happening, which are the precision medicine models are generally focused around one disease. And one of the models that I love, it's a, a company called Aerial Therapeutics and they work on pancreatitis. And if you've had pancreatitis long enough, you're going to eventually get pancreatic cancer. And so just the entire goal is catch it early, stop it. And so they have a model. And the challenge is they found that general practitioners may have had, you know, 500 patients of which maybe two or three have this. So I'm making this up to be extreme. But if I had something that looks like psoriasis and you had something that looked like psoriasis, if I was tagged under that system, it might be a more serious thing that that. I need to be attentive to and how would a physician know that when they're so hopefully we're going to take the vision that you just pressed is taking that little mini precision medicine model and trying to kind of fill the distance between the CDC and you know the individual models and I think that's that's coming it's just when okay well um I hope I'm around to see it. <laughs> now, That's a question, right? <laughs> now, be, before we wrap up, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I think we talked about a lot of things today. We mentioned previously that I my academic website is called healthcaredata.center. And uh, I also have a podcast and my podcast is really around business models. So it's different than yours. So one week I'll talk about precision medicine, then I'll talk to nurses or home care. And that's uh, at chalktalkgym.com chalk talk jim yes that's the james uh, that's the okay. james yes chalk talk jim.com yeah well uh i will definitely give uh that a listen 
Well, I'd like to thank my guest, James Jordan, for appearing on The Art of Medicine. Thank you. Before we close, I'd like to give another thanks to our sponsor, locumstory.com, a resource where providers can get real, unbiased answers about locum tenants. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner. See you next time. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on the art of medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The Art of Medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe www.andrewwilner.com.